Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of Let's Fly. Today we're going to be looking at the Torque Sim SR22 for X-Plane. Now the Torque Sim SR22 models the G3, the third generation SR22, and uh, you get both the turbo normalized and the normally aspirated variant. I'm going to be flying the turbo normalized variant today. Now I happen to fly an SR22 in real life. It's a G2, a second generation turbo normalized. So it's very close. They have the same engine, uh, the IO550 TN with the Tornado Alley Turbo. They have the same airframe basically, uh, only minor changes. Really only changes between the G2 and the G3 are the, the wing and the cap system. But I'm gonna be able to supply a lot of um, useful contextual information about this aircraft from my real life experience. Since this is a take command series aircraft, it's very realistic with very good engine modeling and avionics modeling. Um, and there's a lot of engine maintenance and wear and tear that you also have to be thinking about too if you fly this airplane. So you can see right now from the exterior model that this is a uh, FIKE flight into known icing approved aircraft. We've got the um, porous panels here on the wings and on the rudder and also on the uh, horizontal stabilizer. You can also see that uh, we've got the um, engine inlet covers in, it's chalked, and we've got the pitot covers in. You can remove those by going to the aircraft window here. You get this new Cirrus SR22TN uh, menu, and you can go to the aircraft window. You can tie down the aircraft and put in the fuselage cover. It's a lot of work in real life, but it's one click here. And you can also remove it, remove everything, and now you're ready to fly. This window has a lot of other useful things. Um, on the maintenance page, you can inspect different uh, parts of the aircraft, and you can keep up to date with when your annual is due, how your oil levels are doing when you're 50 and 100 hour are due, as well as watch your Hobbs time and flight time tick up. The load manager page is where you load out the aircraft. You can see we've got two people in the front seat and uh, fuel to the tabs, and we're already near the edge of our envelope. So it's because of that ballistic parachute. The SR-22 doesn't have a, a whole lot of envelope to work with. If you want to carry four people in this aircraft, you can quickly get overweight unless you carry a very small amount of fuel. So we're only going to be carrying two. You can also refill your TKS and oxygen, uh, your TKS being your anti-ice fluid that seeps out of these wing panels and rudder panels panel. And then lastly, you can give it your own custom livery, um, including the color and placement of your tail number, both inside and out. So the plan today, we're parked at San Carlos Airport in Northern California, the Bay Area. The plan today is to fly to Lake Tahoe, uh, South Lake Tahoe Airport. Uh, the trip to Tahoe in the SR-22 takes about 45 minutes and uh, allows us to go high and check out that uh, turbo-normalized aircraft performance at altitude. Along the way, I'll be uh, teaching you how to fly the SR-22, showing you some tips and tricks and techniques as well. Let's hop in the cockpit. All right, here we are inside the cockpit of the SR-22. Um, as you can see, we've got the keys here on the riser and we've got the caps uh, placard covering the caps handle. We've got two doors here on either side that we can open or close. Uh, in real life, most of a pilot's effort on the ground is spent trying to keep the cabin cool. So oftentimes you'd be propping this door up with your elbow or something. We can't really do that here. We can only have it completely opened or completely closed. However, unlike the Take Command uh, Hot Start TBM, it doesn't seem to model interior temperatures. So you won't get that red vignetting as the cabin heats up. We've got our two main instruments, the G1000 Perspective Series. We've got our standby instruments, a series of switches on the booster panel for all of our all of our electrical systems. And on the center console, we've got the, uh, the GDU, the keyboard input for the uh, Perspective G1000, our autopilot controls, our intercom controls, oxygen flaps. The uh, SR22, as you may know, has a single lever power, single power lever operation and a mixture control. The aircraft does have a constant speed propeller. However, the uh, prop is controlled along with the throttle in a single lever. It's not a FADEC. It's not like there's a computer that's controlling the prop RPM. There's simply a mechanical linkage between the propeller RPM and the throttle, and both of them move when you move this lever. You can also set the mixture and you can open up the center console. If you click here, you can put on and take off your headphones. Um, which dampens the engine noise a bit. And uh, you've got that hammer that all services have, uh, which you can use to open a window in the event of an emergency egress.
and you've got the AVI tab here uh, at the co-pilot seat. All right, let's start with the startup routine. So we start by turning on battery two. Battery two is the emergency battery. It's a 30 amp uh, battery that provides power to only the essential bus and the essential systems via a one-way diode. It's only gonna power the left MFD and you can check that the uh, one-way diode is working by verifying that the flap light does not come on because the flap light is not on the essential bus. And uh, once the left MFD is powered up, you can see here that battery one is not discharging and the essential bus is getting 25 volts. With that confirmed, we can now turn on battery one and that will power up the main bus as well and also turn on this warning, which uh, we're not gonna be able to turn off yet. So just live with the beeping for now. Second MFD is gonna power up and the flap light does indeed turn on this time. Now this aircraft comes with Cirrus's Know Your Limits screen. So depending on whether you're a beginning, intermediate, or advanced skier, you can see what their recommended uh, VFR minimums and wind limits are and check yourself as well as night operations and icing conditions. Then you get the uh, fit for flight checklist, uh, the have you considered list, and the passenger briefing list, all Cirrus's attempts to make sure that you're operating this aircraft safely and within limits. And then lastly, uh, now's your opportunity to set the initial fuel in the SR-22, in other words, to reset the totalizer. So we put tabs in, so we'll hit tabs and then enter. Now with that done, we can finally cancel this warning and the caution, and we have the engine page up. Let's continue now, and we're gonna start using the electronic checklists. So let's turn off the engine page, open up the electronic checklist. Now it's presumed we've already done the pre-flight, so we can skip all these pre-flight walk around checklists and get to the before starting engine checklist. So moving through that checklist, we've done our pre-flight. We'll pretend we did. We've got our weight and balance finished. Emergency equipment, passengers, caps handle. We need to remove the safety pin. So let's start by removing the placard and then removing the pin. And now the uh, caps handle, the emergency parachute is available um, to use if we need it. If you're wondering where the uh, the pin went, it's down here in the center console. In real life, by the way, I was taught to leave the placard here, just uh, Velcro to these front two um, Velcro uh, knobs, not all four. That way passengers can quickly access the CAPS checklist if they need. All right, continuing, um, seat, seat belts and harnesses, everyone is buckled in. Next checklist is the starting engine checklist. We're not using external power. Uh, the parking brake is set and both battery masters are on. We have checked the voltage. We'll turn on the strobes, that's this switch here. And we'll set the mixture to full rich. Now what we're gonna do is prime the engine and we gotta be careful because um, the Cirrus as modeled by Torxim is extremely sensitive to prime. This is in contradiction to my experience in real life. I don't know if I just have a lucky airplane, but you can totally abuse my airplane. You can way over prime it, just dump fuel into it, and it'll still start. It just takes a little longer. But uh, I've actually had real trouble starting this aircraft, um, which, is not ex which is unexpected. Um, mixtures full rich, power lever full forward. And we want to set the fuel pump to low boost. So this fuel pump switch has two positions, the high boost slash prime position and the low boost position. The low boost position is used during flight. Uh, if you have a long flight, you can turn it off during cruise, but usually we just leave it on the whole time. And the high boost position is used to prime the engine on cold days. And it's also used um, to clear vapor lock at high altitude. So if you notice you have a very rough running engine at high altitude, you can try switching it to high boost to try to clear out any uh, vapor issues and remove a vapor lock issue um, from your fuel lines. What you don't want to do is ever set it to high boost during a normal cruise situation because it can enrich in the mixture so much that it starves your engine and it'll quit. So don't do that. So let's set the fuel pump to low boost propeller area is clear. Now we'll crack the throttle and we will set the ignition to start. So let's put the keys in the ignition, verify once more that the brakes are set and the prop is clear, area is clear. And then now we'll move it to the start position and hold it until the engine starts. We'll retard the throttle now to maintain a thousand RPM and we will brutally lean the mixture all the way down to the T if we can make it. If the engine stumbles at the T, 
um, we'll just bring it up to the X. But I always try to get it as lean as possible to make sure that I'm not um, fouling up my spark plug. So I try to get it all the way down to the T. And then we also need to verify that the oil pressure comes up within 30 seconds, we would kill the engine if it doesn't. Now we can turn on both alternators and you can see here that uh, the essential bus is now receiving 28 volts from alternator one uh, and the battery is charging. We've got uh, two amps of positive charge coming into the battery. Turn on the avionics power switch. Verify all engine parameters that we would expect are in the green and then we've checked our amperage. So we can go to the before taxi checklist now. So let's once again retard the engine to 1000 RPM, which is where it's supposed to be. We don't want to idle at too high an RPM because the SR22 is pretty loud. You'll see that when we bring it down to 1000 RPM, we get an alternator two alert. Uh, it needs to be, the engine needs to be running at about 1200 RPM for alternator two to excite. So that's okay, we can ignore that one. Uh, flaps up, we would have lowered the flaps to do our pre-flight, so we bring them up now. Radio and avionics is required, we're not going to be using the radio. And uh, cabin heat, defrost. Um, we do have air conditioning in this SR22. It looks like we've opted for the air conditioning option, which uh, is part of the reason why we have virtually no useful load, because that thing weighs like 70 pounds. Um, so you can see we have an electric fan that we can set up to three speeds to try to help cool us down. And we can set uh, where the air gets uh, ducted to, and we can turn on the air conditioner. So we can hit that, turn it on, and you'll notice it takes a good chunk of power away from the uh, engine. So we'll leave it off until after takeoff if we're gonna use it. All right, and lastly, we wanna switch tanks for the fuel selector. Uh, there is no both position, so we're gonna have to switch tanks regularly about every 15 minutes. So let's move it over to the right position, and whenever we switch tanks, we always want the boost pump on, and we wanna verify fuel flow after switching. If we see fuel flow drop off, we go right back to the previous tank and then troubleshoot. All right, that brings us to the before takeoff checklist. So we can put the checklist away for now. Uh, and if we zoom in the map a lot, we should be able to get our safe taxi. Uh, there we go. So we get a little taxi chart we can use. We're parked on the uh, western side of San Carlos, so we're just going to take Juliet up to the 3-0 run-up area, and we're going to perform our run-up. All right, so let's release the parking brake and start taxiing. And as we accelerate out of the parking spot, we're going to tap the brakes, do a quick little brake check, and make sure the brakes are working. Now, the SR22 does not have nose wheel steering. The nose wheel is free castering. The only steering you get is with the brakes at low speed or with the rudder at high speed. So the trick to steering the SR22 is just to tap the brakes. If you start going too heavy on the brakes, uh, you're going to wear down your brake pads pretty quickly. And Lord knows uh, I have done that in a real SR22. So just try to be gentle with it. Just tap the brakes only as much as you need to kind of swing that nose around. Let momentum kind of just carry you through the turn. As we turn, we're just going to verify that the HSI trends to the right, the rate of turn indicator trends to the left here, and then the ball trends opposite turns. And then we verified all of our turning instruments. Let's continue down Julia to the 3-0 run up. All right, let's go back to the checklist now. And uh, we've got our taxiing checklist. We've already done all this. And uh, next up is the before takeoff checklist for the run-up. So we'll verify the doors are latched. In real life, you want to check this seal very closely to make sure the door is actually closed, or else you're going to have to abort your takeoff. Lord knows I've done that a lot, too. Um, caps handle, we want to verify the pins removed in case we need to use it. We will not be using it on this flight, by the way. Uh, seat belts, air conditioner, uh, we're going to leave it off. Fuel quantity, confirm. We've got, we're showing tabs, 46 total. And fuel selector, we want to switch it back to the other tank. And as always, check fuel flow. Fuel pump is still in low boost. Make sure we're going to leave it lean. I like to do my run ups lean uh, so that the EGT moves more um, obviously. We're going to set the flaps to 50% for takeoff, verify that they come down on both sides and that the light comes on. Transponder, we're going to set, so let's go to the transponder page and we'll just make sure it's in alt. It should have been in alt this whole time. New policy from the FAA is that these transponders stay in alt uh, from startup to shutdown. 
autopilot. We can test it. I'm not going to test it because there's currently a bug with the roll trim. You can't actually see where the roll trim is. Like I could bump the roll trim and like it barely moves and look, it kind of just like goes through the stick. Um, and the other problem is you can't, the aileron doesn't actually move. So you can't tell uh, whether the roll trim is centered or not. In real life, normally you would kind of move the roll trim until the aileron here lines up with the wing, but they don't move on the ground, they should. So I don't actually know whether the roll trim is centered. We're just gonna have to figure it out when I take off. And of course you can see this does not line up with center at all, whereas it should normally. Pitch trim works though. You just bump the hat until the trim is in the takeoff band. You can see the takeoff band here, and this is the uh, trim indicator. So that works. But that's why we're not going to test the autopilot, is because it's going to mess up the roll and pitch trim. And I, can't, I don't have an easy way of resetting the roll trim. All right, navigation radios, GPS, let's set it for takeoff. So let's go hit the flight plan page, and we're going to clear out the existing flight plan that's in there. And we're just going to plan our quick flight to Tahoe. So from San Carlos, uh, we're just going to fly direct to Sacramento. So using the keypad, I'm just going to type SAC and enter. And that's the one in the US, not South Korea. And then from there, we're just going to fly to Lake Tahoe KTVL. Very simple flight. Uh, no use of airways, no use of um, departures or arrivals, anything like that. And it's automatically activated the leg to Sacramento, which is great. So we'll close the flight plan now, reopen the checklist, and we've done that. Cabin heat and defrost, brakes set, and power lever. We're going to advance to 1700 RPM for the run up. All right, here we are at 1700 RPM. It's an alternator check. They want us to turn on just a bunch of electrical equipment. So we'll turn on the landing light speedo heat and verify that, you know, the battery is still receiving charge and the essential bus is still receiving 28 volts. I'm going to leave the landing light on, but we'll turn off the pitot heat. So we've done all these steps here now onto the mag check. So let's move the mag to the left position. We should see the EGTs rise and power levels and RPM drop a bit and then back to both. And we should see the EGTs drop. Now I'm barely seeing these EGTs move, which is not my experience in real life. In real life, these EGTs, I mean, they take a little time to get going, but they move quite a bit. So if this were real life, I'd probably be thinking about maybe scrubbing the flight because I'm not getting the response from the EGTs that I expect. But we'll continue. So let's move the mag to the right position. RPM drops and EGTs come up just the tiniest bit. We'll move it back to both. EGTs drop like maybe a pixel and RPM goes back. So that completes the mag check. Engine parameters just want to verify all of our instruments are in the green. Power lever back to a thousand. And we'll check our flight instruments now. So we just want to cross check with the standby instruments airspeed against airspeed, attitude against attitude, ball against ball, and altitude against altitude. Um, barometric pressure right now is about 2988, so we're going to set that here on both places. You can barely read the barometric pressure there. There we go. And realistically, there's actually a slight discrepancy in how the altimeters read. Um, the discrepancy is more than this in my airplane. So, so and lastly, we want to check um, heading indicator versus standby compass. All right, our flight instruments have been checked. Flight controls, we'll just check the ailerons on the left and on the right, and then the elevators, make sure everything is rigged and controls are free. We'll set the trim for takeoff, we've already done that, and the autopilot is disconnected. For some guidance, what we'll do is we'll turn on the flight director, we'll set it to heading mode, and we'll set runway heading, uh, which is 302. So let's roll this down to 302. And then we will set a uh, flight level change climb with a climb speed of 130 knots. I like to climb between 120 or 130 knots depending on how much engine cooling I need. I'll climb at 130 on hotter days. Um, and we will arm the, uh, the altitude mode is armed. So we'll set this to our target altitude. We're gonna climb to uh, 1200 feet initially um, as we perform the um, uh, downwind departure to Coyote Hills. 
All right, so flight director is set. So all we have to do now is run our takeoff. All right, now the other thing you gotta remember is because you can't steer with nose wheel steering, only with brakes, you need to be moving forward in order to steer. So you need at least some airspeed in order to steer the aircraft. If you come to a complete stop, um, first of all, if you come to a complete stop, make sure your nose wheel is straight so that you don't put pressure on the nose wheel when you increase power. And secondly, you gotta make sure that uh, you have some distance forward you can move before you start steering. All right, we're about ready to take the runway. Um, we are on the tank uh, with the most fuel. So let's uh, do my quick little before takeoff checks. So uh, mixture, bring it rich. Flaps, 50. Lights, trim, transponder. Doors and windows. Pump has already been set, timer. We'll start a timer for the flight, which we'll use to change our um, fuel tanks with. Now for takeoff, we simply bring it up to full power with right rudder. We're getting 2700 RPM, engine gauges are all in the green, airspeed's alive, rotate is going to be at 70 knots. There's 70. That's positive rate. So we'll pitch down now to capture our climb speed of 130 knots. There's 200 feet, flaps up. And we'll reduce power uh, to hold 20, to get 2,500 RPM or whatever max RPM we can get at the uh, maximum manifold pressure, which is 29.6 inches. So we'll set 29.6 and we can just about get 2,500 RPM. As we pass the diamond shaped waterway now, we're gonna make our right turn. Flying over Redwood Shores, we're gonna turn onto the downwind now, continue our climb to 1,200 feet. 800 feet, we say the after takeoff checks, which are flaps, maps, and caps. So the flaps are up, the map page is shown, though we need to zoom out, we'll do that in a bit, and the caps, we say caps to remind ourselves that above 800 feet, caps is available. So before that, if something happens, we're forced to land. After that, we have the option to use caps if we want. All right, we're on the downwind. Let's sink the heading bug now. Zoom out the map a bit um, so that we can see where we're going. And we'll hold 1200 now, continue flying on the downwind, start a left turn to Coyote Hills, which you can see right out there. So we'll start that left turn to Coyote Hills now. We'll climb to 1,500 feet, and we'll just do some step climbs under the Bravo here. We'll sink the heading bug once again. And I'm gonna turn on the autopilot at this point. First, I'm gonna set the altitude bug to 1,500 feet. We're gonna arm flight level change. We're gonna set flight level change mode. I'm gonna turn on the autopilot and yaw damper at this point. All right. So now we're flying with the autopilot. In real life, I do almost all of my flying in the Cirrus with the autopilot. The next thing to do would be to switch to a lean of peak climb. Uh, the Tornado Alley turbo aircraft, um, are, you are approved for a, either a rich of peak or a lean of peak climb, depending on the kind of climb performance you want, but you may only cruise lean of peak. They don't publish values for rich of peak. It's not approved. You must cruise lean of peak. Uh, since we don't have a hurry to get up high, we might as well climb uh, lean of peak. So to go lean of peak, we grab a hold of the mixture and with one smooth and re reasonably quick pull, we bring it back to about 16 gallons per hour. So you see here, 16 gallons per hour is our target. Now we're gonna adjust that target as necessary. Our goal here is to keep CHTs below 380 um, ideally and absolutely below 450 and to keep turbine inlet temperature the tits um, below 1600 ideally and absolutely below 1750 so you can see we're doing fine now so we'll leave it at 16 gallons per hour I'm gonna roll the uh, altitude bug up now to 11,500 we'll pretend we've been cleared into the Bravo and we'll start our whoops we'll start our climb up to 115 there's 11.5, we'll hit the IAS bug, and we'll set the target speed to 130 knots, and up the airplane goes. 
crossing over Coyote Hills now, so we're going to set uh, on course, so we'll hit the direct to button, get direct to Sacramento, and then we'll set nav to activate nav mode. And now we're flying direct to Sacramento, climbing into the Bravo up to 11,500. So as we climb, as the airspeed goes down, engine cooling, the engine's going to heat up. You can see the CHTs are climbing, and uh, we want to be monitoring CHTs. If it gets too hot, we want to further lean the mixture. Remember, we're lean of peak, so to cool the engine, we have to take the fuel flow away from peak, so we will lean the mixture. Let's keep the heading bug synced. Uh, the other thing you can do is go full rich and just switch to a rich of peak climb because remember this is a turbocharged engine. You don't lean the mixture as you climb. You set a fuel flow, either full rich or whatever lean of peak fuel flow you want to target and just leave it there because the engine's going to be generating, um, the turbocharger's going to be generating sea level pressure all the way up to the maximum altitude of 25,000 feet. So you can either go full rich uh, you can go full rich um, if you're having engine cooling issues, but I find that just reducing this to further lean, 15, even 14 gallons per hour, sometimes I can get 14 without the engine starting to stumble, um, helps cool it a lot better. CHT is now 354 in the climb uh, and climbing, and then tits are right where we want them at 1600 RPM, or sorry, 1600 degrees Fahrenheit. This map is kind of a mess, so I'm just going to go ahead and declutter it a bit. Let's take it down to declutter one. It's going to make it a lot better. There is a climb checklist for the SR-22. There's not much in it except for to verify your engine instruments, your fuel flow, um, your active tank. There's really not a whole lot else into it. Um, there's, uh, there's not really anything else that you have to do after takeoff. It's a very easy airplane to fly. You can see CHTs are trending closer to 380. We're keeping an eye on that. Now remember, when you're operating this aircraft, lean a peak fuel flow uh, is set with the mixture. And fuel flow, honestly, is going to be primarily your main power setting. Because you're always going to have your manifold pressure as high as you can get it uh, to maintain uh, 2,500 RPM and 29.6 inches of mercury. And you can see we're not quite doing 29.6, we're doing 26.8. Sometimes you can increase the power a bit and it will let the manifold pressure come up without altering RPM. But you wanna keep RPM at 2,500 and just get as much manifold pressure as you can at that speed. Once you've done that, you can see here where it yeah, starts to climb at about 29.3, so we'll leave it there. Once you've done that, manifold pressure and RPM is going to stay the same for the whole climb. So you set your power really with the fuel flow. As you can see, if I come back on the mixture, the percent power comes down. And we do need to come back on the mixture because you can see here, CHTs are coming well above 380. They're at 388 now. So let's come back, uh, get it down even to 14.5. Got to be listening to make sure the engine doesn't start stumbling. That gives us 66% power in the climb, about 500 feet per minute, and our CHT should start trending downward. The other options you have, again, are to increase your speed or go full wrench. Now, setting power with fuel flow, this is true in cruise, too. Again, in cruise, you're going to want to target 29.6 inches of manifold pressure and as much RPM as you can get, usually between 24 and 2,500. And then you set your fuel economy uh, just based on the mixture. So if you want to get there quick, set it to like 16 and a half, even 17 gallons per hour. If you're not in a hurry and you want to save gas, set it to like 14, 15 gallons per hour and you'll cruise slower. All right, looks like the CHTs have recovered, so I'm going to increase the mixture a bit. We're not going to go all the way back up to 16.5 because that was a bit too hot. We're going to give 15 gallons per hour a try and see how that does with the CHTs. It should give us a bit more climb. The other important thing to remember here is on cooler days, your CHTs will be cooler and you'll be able to increase power before the CHTs start getting above 380. But just because you can doesn't mean you should because there's actually two things going on. Uh, one is your cylinder head temperature, but the other is your ICP, which is your intracylinder pressure. As you increase fuel flow, you increase the temperature of the cylinder head, but you also increase the amount of pressure uh, at the peak pressure point of the cylinder. And when that happens, um, 
if the pressure increases too much you can start causing long term damage to the cylinders so because of that even if it's a very cold day and you're able to push your fuel flow higher before you get to three eighty on the c h t s you should not you should stick to fuel flows that you know from past experience work because otherwise you're going to increase those i c p s and you're going to start damaging your cylinders and we don't have an instrument in the cockpit to measure i c p all we've got is our c h t so we use the c h t as our guide to make sure we stay below 380 and on colder days we don't increase power above known fuel flow settings that work for us just because it's cooler and we can get more out of the engine before the CHTs start coming up above 380. Hope that makes sense. As we continue to climb we'll take a look at the cockpit a bit more. So as you can see here we've got the circuit breakers on the bottom right. In real life these are near impossible to read and use. You would kind of have to shove your head down into this uh, floor panel here in order to read any of the uh, circuit breakers um, because of that it's useful to kind of memorize the positions of circuit breakers you'll need because otherwise in an emergency you pretty much have no hope. But I don't know if the G3 made things better or if it's just the way that X-Plane renders the cockpit but of course it's very easy to read the circuit breakers here. We've also got the alternate static source knob and we've got the ELT controls down here at the bottom and on the left side we've got our fire extinguisher. We've already shown you the center console where we've got our uh, headphones and our USB ports. And on the front here, we do have our hobs and our flight time meters. These do actually tick up, so I've put 7.5 hours on the hobs for this aircraft and 4.4 hours of flight time. We've got our fuel selector. You can see we're burning from the left tank. It's coming down, and uh, if we lift this handle, we can move it to the off position. I would recommend doing that. We have our oxygen. We can turn it on here and uh, normally you would have um, cannulas plugged into the oxygen ports which uh, are around here somewhere on mine the oxygen ports are in the center console so i'm not quite sure where they are in the g3 got your flap controls we've already covered all of this the avi tab uh, can be integrated with navigraph so i can plug in my own charts or i can bring up an airport and then I have access to the charts for that airport. And it's saying pitot heat required, uh, as that's because the temperature is dropping below five degrees. But as you can see, there's absolutely no visible moisture, so the pitot heat's not actually required. So we'll just acknowledge the caution. So we can bring up the airport chart here, and that comes straight from Navigraph, and it's available on my AVI tab. Air conditioning controls, as I mentioned previously, uh, these vents would also be used to help cool and, more importantly, to provide airflow for your iPad, but you can't open them in the sim. We've also got Milkshake, everybody's favorite cow here. He sits on the instrument panel and joins you for your flights. I've already mentioned the uh, X1000 uh, has some of most of the important features of the G1000. You've got the airport, you've got waypoint information, including um, frequencies and runway information and then you've got the nearest page uh, but you don't have any of the utilities um, which is unfortunate on the flight plan uh, you do have vertical descent uh, vertical path management here so we can activate the cursor and uh, set target altitudes for each waypoint if we want uh, but we can't create a long track waypoints or anything like that so nothing too fancy uh, the engine page, as we mentioned, also keeps track of your oxygen, remaining oxygen, as well as your remaining TKS. Because this is a Fikey aircraft, we do have two TKS reservoirs holding four quarts each, and we should have the time remaining available in uh, when the pump is set to norm, high, and max. So TKS controls are here with the other switches. You can turn on the TKS, um, and you can set the pump to norm or high and push button max. Uh, in max, it'll just dump out TKS fluid along these panels here to just break up any large deposits of ice that might have formed on your wings. Um, you also have a backup pump required for FIKE certification, and this button here activates a windshield spray bar, uh, which sprays the windshield with TKS. There's also a slinger ring in the prop, which uh, uses centrifugal force to bring to sling TKS uh, fluid onto the prop, which de-ices the propeller when the TKS system is on. That'll also sling some uh, fluid onto the windshield. Do not recommend pressing the windshield button 
when uh, you need to see outside because it will impair your view for a short while. We're at 15 minutes on the timer, so boost pump on. We'll switch to the right tank, verify fuel flow. Fuel flow looks good. So as I was saying, um, you get 30, about 30 minutes in max, about an hour in high, and about two and a half hours in norm. Uh, after that, you run out of TKS and you don't have any um, any you don't have any remaining ability to remove ice from your wings. In the anti-ice page here, you can set whether to de-ice with the left or the right tanks or automatically. And the assist page is for lean assist, but again, we have a naturally aspirated, sorry, we have a turbo normalized engine, so we don't need to do any leaning. We just set fuel flow based on the amount of power we want. And you can see the uh, amperage and voltage of each of the buses and each of the batteries. All right, so that about does it for the engine page. Um, on the fuel page again is where you reset the totalizer and we can go out of the engine page and we're back to the map page. Let's go have a look now at the uh, additional synop synoptics provided by um, TorqueSim. Again, these are cheating because you don't see this information in the aircraft, but on the electrical system page you can see the status of all 11 buses in the aircraft, how much voltage and amperage each bus is drawing, as well as the three distribution buses, main bus 1 and 2 and the essential bus, and um, both alternators and both batteries. So you can watch as your batteries charge or discharge. Um, you can check if you've been having trouble starting the engine, this will tell you whether the battery has been completely discharged, and you can go to the aircraft window to recharge your battery if you need to. On the engine page, we can take a look at the flow of fuel and air across the engine. So on the upper deck here, we can see uh, manifold upper deck pressure and uh, pressure at the air filter, which does cause a little bit of drag, and so it uh, does reduce available manifold pressure by just a tiny bit. And then you can see the temperature and pressure at the oil cooler inlet um, at the uh, end of the compressor as the air goes from the upper deck to the engine. And, uh, and then you can also see the, how open the wastegate is. Once the wastegate is fully open, um, that means the full amount of pressurized air is being provided to the engine. The engine's at its critical altitude and any further climb will result in a drop off in manifold pressure, just like with a naturally aspirated engine. And then we've got our turbine inlet and outlet temperatures and our turbine inlet pressure, as well as our CHT and EGT for each of our six cylinders. Pretty cool stuff. I certainly wish, there are times when I've had weird turbo issues that I certainly have wished I could have that information in the plane with me in real life. All right, we're coming above 10,000 feet now, so I'm gonna turn off the landing light. And it looks like we got smooth sailing ahead. So I'm just going to relax, we'll enjoy the flight, and we'll check back in on the cruise. We have Cirrus' famous level button, the blue button here. If nothing else, if you're disoriented or nothing else is working, or even if the autopilot does something funky or the airplane does something funky, you can just pound the blue button and the airplane will level itself. Uh, it levels itself using pitch and roll only, so only using the AHARs to set about a three degree pitch and uh, level the wings. So it doesn't use any other information. So if you have an airspeed or uh, attitude failure, sorry, if you have an airspeed or altimeter failure, like a pitot tube failure, uh, this will still level the aircraft. If your GPS is broken, obviously it'll still level the aircraft. Um, it won't maintain altitude because it's maintaining a pitch, a nose pitch, but it is a good um, oh crap button that will just stabilize the aircraft so that you can start getting your head out of the sand and figuring out what's wrong. All right, it's 100 feet to go and we are established in the cruise. Pretty much uh, in my aircraft what you do is you go full power for one minute like so and you let the aircraft accelerate for a full minute and you go mixture rich as well and that gives you about 100% power, which it should. And it also accelerates you pretty good. And then after a minute uh, at full power, uh, you reduce the throttle to set about 2,500 RPM with max available manifold pressure as long as it's below 29.6. And then you reduce back to about 16 gallons per hour with one big smooth pull of the mixture. 
and you go back to monitoring CHTs and EGTs. You want to verify before you go lean of peak that CHT and uh, tits are below uh, 380 and 1600 respectively. So it looks like we're getting pretty good cooling at 16.8 or 80% power. Uh, CHTs are at 330. They're still climbing. We'll see how they uh, true out, but it looks pretty good for now. The only other items on the checklist really um, are to start a timer so that you turn off the boost pump 30 minutes into the cruise. Uh, but that's about it. There's really other no configuration changes to make. All right, another thing we can do to prepare for the descent is set up our VNAV. So what we want to do is hit the flight plan button to go to our flight plan. And uh, Tahoe, South Lake Tahoe Airport, airport elevation is about 6,300 feet. So if we want to arrive at South Lake Tahoe at pattern altitude, which is 7,300, we just simply set 7300 zero, zero, and hit enter. And now it's showing us um, that we'll cross Sacramento at 11,500. Sometime after that, we'll start our descent. And as you can see, um, it's planning a target descent of about 800 feet per minute. That's what I like to do in real life. And uh, we have 20 minutes till top of descent. If we go back to the map page, we see our top of descent indication at some point after Sacramento. There it is, that little white dot there marks the top of descent. So we're just crossing over Sacramento now. We'll check back in at top of descent and um, continue with our flight and the landing at Tahoe. All right, so it's been about 30 minutes. It hasn't been 30 minutes in the cruise. It's been about 30 minutes in the flight, but we'll pretend it's been 30 minutes in the cruise. Uh, so we can turn off the boost pump uh, by switching it to off. When we do, fuel flow is gonna fall off a bit. So just make sure to increase it back to where it was um, when you had the pump on. And as always, you wanna be constantly checking your engine during cruise, making sure that CHTs are below 380 and tits are below 1600. And also we should be keeping our heading bug synced as well. The other cool thing about this aircraft is the cup holders work. There's one down here, there's one down here. If you ever own a Cirrus in real life, my strong advice is to always stow these cup holders before you uh, get out or in of the air, get out of or into the aircraft. Otherwise, inevitably, you'll just put a foot down here and you will obliterate your cup holder. That is a $250 replacement. Uh, for the back seaters, there's cup holders back here. You can just barely see them, but they go down and up as well. All right, it's been a little while since we've gotten an altimeter setting. We've got Sacramento behind us. Uh, we'll just grab the altimeter setting from Sacramento. Normally, we'd listen to the ATIS for that, but uh, I'm just going to quickly grab it from Active Sky. Sacramento altimeter is 2980, so we'll just set that here. It's important to uh, reset your altimeter when flying VFR uh, every maybe 50 to 100 miles or so, just to make sure you're flying at the proper altitude. Don't forget it to set it on the standby as well, 2980. There we go. And we just cross check. And there's actually quite a difference between the uh, standby and the primary altimeter. coming up on 45 minutes so it's time to switch the tanks again now remember we turned off the boost pump so we got to turn it back on before we can switch the tanks when we turn the boost pump back on fuel flow is going to go up uh, this may bring CHT or EG or uh, tits above uh, where we want it to be but as long as we just quickly switch the tank and then turn it back off it's not a big deal so we'll go pump on switch the tanks verify the fuel flow and then pump back off Fuel flow settles back down to where it was, and our CHTs are safely below 380, and tits are right at 1600. So uh, temperatures are looking great. At this power setting, we're truing out at about 185 knots at 76% power. That's quite a bit faster than I would expect, at least for my Cirrus. Uh, typically, these, these power settings would result in around 80% power, and I would expect maybe 175 to 180 knots true. Uh, so this thing is faster. I don't know if it's because the G3 wing has been redesigned and so it's a little more efficient or maybe it's lighter than I'm used to. I'm not sure, but uh, it's definitely, I appreciate the extra five or 10 knots of speed. All right, we're 
coming to a minute until top of descent. So I'm going to bring the altitude knob down to pattern altitude, 7,300 feet. So we'll roll it down. Too far down. 7,300. And since we're within one minute of top of descent, we can arm VNAV. And now we see vertical path is armed, altitude mode is active. And we've got the vertical path indication here. When this carrot intercepts the datum line, the aircraft is going to pitch down and target this vertical speed uh, for our descent. Of course, you can see directly ahead that we have this issue, namely these mountains are in the way. So we're also going to switch it to heading select and uh, we're going to move the heading bug over to the right here and capture this pass uh, into South Lake so that we don't descend right into the mountains. In real life, when flying into Lake Tahoe, you always want to check the winds because if the winds at the peaks are strong, you want to cross nice and high in case you hit any downdrafts. The good news is, since I'm using real-time weather and uh, it's a very calm day today, I'm not worried about any updrafts or downdrafts, so I don't mind being low. All right, as you can see, vertical path is active with altitude select armed, but because we're heading into the uh, the canyon path here, I'm actually just going to go ahead and disable the autopilot by hitting, uh, pressing down on the center of this trim button to activate the autopilot disconnect. We'll turn the yaw damper back on for now, but we'll leave the autopilot off. And we'll just fix up the roll trim and we'll continue our descent into this canyon here and we'll follow the canyon into uh, South Lake. Let's bring this back to the map view by closing the flight plan and zoom in so we can watch our progress through the canyon. So when we descend in the SR-22, we begin the descent checklist. The descent checklist is also really short, just involves a check of your engine instruments. We want to make sure as we descend that CHTs don't go below 240 degrees. Uh, I like to leave the power where it is, so I'm going to keep it at about 77%, fuel flow, manifold pressure, RPM, all the same, and I'll take the extra speed. Uh, if I get into the yellow arc above VNO and it's bumpy, then I'll come back on the power so that I uh, stay below the cruise air penetration speed and bumpy air. Otherwise, I'll just take the extra speed and descend at full power. No problem with that. I'm using uh, Orbex Truex, True Earth NorCal scenery in case you're wondering. Uh, so all this ortho is from the Orbex Truex, Orbex, I can't even say it, the Orbex True Earth NorCal uh, product, which looks really good. Um, as you can see, parts of it, you know, they need more trees here uh, to cover up these satellite trees. And uh, a while back, I don't know, you might have noticed, but a while back there were some bad blends in the ortho, some sharp lines where uh, it was badly blended. But uh, in a lot of places, the ortho looks pretty good, and I'm happy with it. All right, so you can see Lake Tahoe in the basin. Uh, South Lake is going to be it's kind of behind this hill here in a valley there. Big altimeter change. Altimeter is 3019, so we're going to set that. That's pretty typical because the mountain range does a really good job of separating air masses. So we got a completely different air mass here. Um, but the winds are calm at South Lake, so we can choose either runway. So we're going to land on 18 uh, southbound. Slightly more hazardous go around to 18 because it puts you uh, towards the mountains if you need to go around. Fortunately, the Cirrus has excellent climb, especially Ridge and Peak. So if we do need to go around, uh, better if we don't, but if we do need to, uh, we should be able to outclimb. And there's the airport. You can see there right next to that little hump of a hill. All right, so we're going to cross midfield over the airport at 8,300. That's 1,000 feet above pattern altitude. And then we're going to start slowing down and entering the pattern on a 45, as you should do at an uncontrolled field. All right, so we're going to overfly the airport at 8,300 feet. It's 1,000 feet above pattern altitude. And we're going to bring the power back, start slowing down. As we overfly the airport, just look up and down the runway, try to see the windsock if we can, and just try and look and see what traffic is doing. Look in the pattern, try to see if there's anyone in the pattern, what direction they're going. And now we can turn outbound uh, to enter the 45 on a teardrop. As we turn outbound, we'll do our landing checks. So that's gas, we'll turn the pump on, and we'll switch to the fuller tank. We're already on the fuller tank, so we won't switch. Uh, mixture, we'll go mixture rich. And propeller, seat belts are all set switches. We'll make sure the landing light's on and all our other switches uh, necessary on. 
and lastly systems bring up the engine page make sure everything is in the green i will make a nice sprightly right turn here as we descend to 7300 feet pattern altitude um, and enter on the 45 we do have a little terrain coming up as you can see so we're going to make this a nice steep turn 45 degrees of bank and we're going to keep that descent coming going down to 7300 feet all right the airport should be coming into view shortly there it is point ourselves onto the 45 there we go keep descending to 7300 and we'll slow to the first flap speed which is 119 knots all right we'll check the downwind make sure we're not converging with anyone then we'll turn onto the downwind level at 75 or 7300 and now we're at 119 knots, so we'll put in the first notch of flaps, flaps 50, and we're going to need some nose pressure to keep the nose from bumping up. When we, uh, we're going to need some forward stick pressure to keep the nose from jumping up when we put in the flaps. Cirrus measures the flaps in percentage, so you get flap 0, 50, and 100%. Uh, what that means is 0, 16, or 32 degrees of flaps, but they call it by percentage. We're below 104 knots, which is the uh, flaps 100 speed, so we'll go to flaps 100. And again, forward stick to prevent the nose from jumping up. You can see we're already a bit above pattern altitude. Let's bring the power back and descend a bit too. We give ourselves a nice long base to stabilize. It's always good to fly the Cirrus like it's on rails because it has pretty poor stall characteristics. The stall can really sneak up on you. So you want to fly it like it's on rails, have a good margin above stall speed, and don't drag the nose across the sky. We'll unload, do one last check of the final, make sure there's nobody coming, and then we'll turn on the final and start descending um, to the runway. Now, Cirrus recommends 80 knots for your final approach speed. I find that that gives me a lot of floats. So I like to fly it at 75 knots. Do not get too slow on the final for the reasons that I just mentioned. Very poor stall characteristics, so you want to stay well above the stall speed. As we get lower, we lose the ability to use caps, so we need to make a mental note that if something happens, we're committed to land, and we should not pull the parachute. So we're aiming for about 75 knots. We're a little high on the approach, as you can see on the pappies, so we're letting the nose slip down. You can see on the synthetic vision that we do have our highway in the sky giving us a uh, simulated glide path to the airport. It doesn't quite line up with what the pappies are showing, but it's a nice long runway, so I'm not too worried about it. All right, there's 75 knots. We're coming over the threshold. Start bringing the nose back and slowly inching the power out to give it a nice soft landing. And there we go. We can let the nose come down and bring it to a halt. You can stand on the brakes if you need to, but you know, as a Cirrus pilot, you're going to be using the brakes a lot just because there's no nose wheel steering. So the less braking you do, kind of the more uh, money you'll save on brake pads, especially because, you know, you're just going to be doing a lot of braking left and right when you steer. Coming off the runway, flaps up, turn off the landing light, re-lean the mixture again, brutally lean all the way back to the T if you can get it, and tapping on the brakes now to bring us to the uh, parking area. That's a neat, cool little effect. You can see the keys swing as I apply lateral G's. Uh, unfortunately, it looks like they're swaying in the wrong direction, but good effort. In real life, your number one concern right now would be cooling the cabin, so you'd probably crack a door or something right after coming off the runway. All right, I'll park it between those two uh, uninspiring looking Cessnas. SR-22 has a 44-foot wingspan, a little bit longer than a Cessna, but should fit into most parking spaces. All 
right, let's kind of try to aim it up as good as we can using our uh, brake technique, and then we'll just come to a halt. And we bring the throttle all the way back, bring the mixture all the way back. We could turn off the avionics and the strobes. And you'll notice the engine doesn't quit even with the mixture all the way back. You have to turn off the boost pump for the engine to actually quit. And then we can turn off both alternators, both batteries, turn off the mags, and we're pretty much done. One thing you should always remember to do is to safety up the uh, caps handle. So we'll just click here to put the pin uh, back into the handle, and then we can click here to replace the cover. And that is about it. All right, so that concludes our flight in the Torx MSR-22. It's a wonderfully modeled aircraft with lots of beautiful details. The engine modeling is exquisite. The numbers work out pretty much exactly as I would expect. This is a first release, so there are some bugs. You saw bugs with the roll trim in particular. Um, so hopefully that gets fixed soon. And as with all airplanes that use the Laminar Research uh, X1000, G1000 simulation, there's a lot of missing functionality in the G1000. So I wouldn't necessarily use it as a procedures trainer for the G1000. But uh, in terms of capturing the numbers when it comes to flying a Cirrus, definitely does a great job. I hope you learned something and I hope you get a chance to fly this aircraft yourself. Thank you very much for watching. This is Tim Morgan, signing off.